Let's go. Hello, welcome to Shoot the Defense. Uh, another episode, and I've got two co-hosts again, as ever. The two, you know, th this is this is like a, a month, a weekly gathering, isn't it? You know, us three, we all get together, we sing kumbaya. I don't know how to play the guitar. Rod, do you know how to play the guitar? Nope. No. Okay. You got the Death Row Records hoodie on though, so you Tupac fan, Suge Knight. Oh, well, I'm not so much Suge Knight, but yeah, Tupac. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. old ones. Mm, what's your favourite album? Oh, that's a difficult question. That's probably All Eyes on Me. All Eyes on Me. Ah, yes, the uh, the double CD edition, right? Yep. There you go. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So I've introduced Rodri. Steve's here. How are you doing, Steve? I'm still okay. You good? Yeah, I'm really good. You? Yeah, all good, mate. All good. No, well, I'd, I'd say all good, but we had a discussion about my team in Cyprus getting a draw against the bottom place team. I'm not going to go into that tonight because it'll, it'll, it'll damage my confidence. But let's talk about the Premier League because there's more goals and there's more entertainment. And Man City, Steve, 5 0 against Burnley. I, I think we saw that coming given Burnley's injuries, given the, the, their starts to the season. I, don't, I know they've had a couple of wins in the past few weeks, but City were just went head first didn't they and I think that's what you need to do against teams that are kind of on the ropes no? Yeah of course uh, and remaining humble as a supporter but um, I think we saw it coming just at the fixture because it's 44 goals in 12 games against Burnley I think it's 5-5 five, five nils uh, on the trot or, or, or certainly close um, almost lambs to the slaughter um, completely outnumbered and outplayed in the middle of the pitch every time we play them in City's favour um, Kevin De Bruyne always seems to play well Raheem Sterling didn't even get on the pitch and of course Mahrez will take the headlines for his hat-trick and it's a fixture that uh, the City really, really enjoy home and away and they have done for some time Was this a must-win game though? I know the season hasn't been going too well for you guys you had a good result in the Champions League midweek which I was pretty pleased about given the opponents but again we won't go into them will we rod <laughs> but uh yeah again you went all guns blazing against you guys but given the pressure that pep guardiola has been under especially signing a new two-year contract was this a must-win game for you lot no not a must-win it was expected i think obviously um i think there were 13 goals down from where they were 12 months ago people were suggesting that uh, the goals weren't being shared around they're not doing it without aguero uh they dried up uh, they've lost, uh, you know, plan B, if you like. So it kind of like goes close to resetting the model, if you like, of free scoring, albeit just in, in one fixture. But it puts the goal difference back, you know, really healthy. And obviously we don't want to compare what we do this Saturday, last Saturday to last season, because you'll never move forward if you're always looking back. But uh, I think there was just a few question marks that uh, had they been found out, are they easy to play against? Do you know how to, to counter-attack against them like Leicester did at the Etihad? And like I say, the goals count had, had become less. And the support cast, I mean, they're all elite footballers, but, you know, Mares, Bernardo Silva was their purple patch 15 months ago. And when are they going to come, you know, back and play play really well again now? From Mares's point of view, that was obviously Saturday. And, you know, for the rest of them now, we're hoping that we'll, we'll kick in now and, and make more of a challenge. You mentioned Riyad Mahrez grabbed a fantastic hat trick. What is it about this player? Because for me, it's almost as if he blows hot and cold. We know he's got the ability, but why do you think he doesn't do it frequently? Um, I think you want, you you recognise how he plays. I think I think you can work out how he plays. The hard thing is obviously stopping him. Um, occasionally, he chops and goes down the down the wing down the right wing and uses his right foot. But he's always looking to score. I think most people have sussed out that he's not actually often looking to pass either. So if you cut down uh, or usher him and defend him and, and keep him away from shooting areas, um, the chances are that you're going to obviously limit his numbers. Um, but at Burnley, I think we retreated. We were in full flow. I think De Bruyne benefited from a rest in midweek and had another yard in his legs. And obviously, we were very much on the front foot, which allows Mares to get in the, in the last third. And let's like say, you, you know he's going to come in on his left and shoot at goal, but stopping him is the tough thing. And uh, um, he's still a wonderful footballer, but we actually have three in that position um, that enjoy the the, uh, the left-footed experience on the right wing, which is Phil Foden, Bernardo Silva and Mares. But 
obviously Mares scoring hat tricks. Um, he's the most mm. prolific. He's been a Premier League winner and high scorer in the Premier League. Um, when he gets it right, he's he's devastating. No, I agree with you, mate. Rod uh, Mendy scored his first goal in four years, I think, something along those lines. Uh, are we going to see more of him, or is Cancelo going to come in and replace him again? Uh, it, it depends. I mean, he likes to chop and change, and depends obviously how it is in training. But like you said, he's first goal in four years. He looked he looked a player in when he first came in, but. You know, he's got a bad injury and he's tailed off. So, but, you know, he's got his first goal, maybe he'll kick on and, and get some consistency, in, consistency in, under his belt. But, no, nah, I think for the future, it's going to be, it's going to be Constello. But do you think it's a problem that Guardiola is constantly chopping and changing his defensive line? Yeah, I was, I was listening, yeah, I was listening, sorry, I was listening to what you're saying there. It's with, with you saying with Mara, and you're saying hot and cold. I think he need, might be one of them players that just needs to play every week. Mm. You know, when he's, maybe he's in and he's out. And these some players that like to have a run of games and, and, and keep playing, and some players it doesn't work for them when they're chopping and they're in and they're out. So, but um, yeah, it's a problem that, you, that all the top managers got, and it's something you, you just got to you've got to uh, jiggle about and just work best you can. But you know, it's a good problem to have, isn't it? Yeah, but the thing is, when City won the title back to back, you could pretty much name their regular back four, couldn't you? But now you don't know if they're going to play three at the back or four at the back. And I don't know. For me, I'm I'm just a stickler for consistency, especially when it comes to the defensive line. I think that's key. But Steve, I don't know if you agree with me on this, mate. But surely it's a bit detrimental that Guardiola is making so many defensive changes. Like I know Ake is injured, but when he comes back there's obviously more options, but you've got Laporte, you've got Ruben Diaz, you've got John Stones who played at the weekend, you've obviously got Mendy Zinchenko, you've got Cancelo, you've got, you've got so many options there, but does he even know his back four, his best system defensively? Yeah, I think it's I, I think it's Walker, Diaz, Laporte and Mendy, but Laporte never seems to play three or four games on the trot, neither does Mendy. Walker, you think, could play for 12 months of the year, every game, every minute, no problem. Um and obviously, I do believe that Stones has probably played his best game for two seasons at least on Saturday. 100% pass completion, 100% heading completion, looked full of confidence, looks like his legs thickened up, looks like um, he was just a little bit more assured. He just looked a little bit stronger and, and ready for task. So I was pleased with that. He doesn't get in the starting team for me. And I think, you know, it's not ideal, but I do think the chopping and changing is because Laporte seems to just miss one game a month, sometimes more. Mendy seems to miss two games a month because they're never hundred percent fit. So I think it's a case of, of he's had to do that at times. And uh, then I think when Fernandinho, you know, was out and were the centre half protected, and I think he's been experimenting. Every manager in, in the world experiments, but I think now he's found a formula. And I think that's actually people talk about Laporte, who doesn't even make the France squad. I do believe this Diaz coming in has really, really balanced us up, give us some composure, give us some extra height, give us a different type of passing range, another threat uh, in both boxes, obviously the attacking box, and he's very safe in our own. And I think he's been a real asset. And I think he's actually, whilst playing well himself, got another 5%, 10% out of the rest just by settling the, settling the back line down. Mm. What is it with Benfica finding all these fantastic central defenders? Ruben Diaz, David Luiz... Victor Lindelof <laughs> must be in the must be in the water or something. I don't know. I don't know. All right, uh, Brighton Liverpool won a piece controversy on and off the pitch. Uh, Mope missed a penalty. Salah had the goal disallowed. Jota gave Liverpool the lead. Sadio Mane uh, thought he made it too, but that was given offside. Pascal Gross then scored the penalty, and then. Jurgen Klopp proceeded to absolutely destroy poor Des Kelly <laughs> live on telly. Uh, Rod, let's talk about the game quickly because I'm sure we'll speak at great length about Jurgen Klopp's tirade. Um, Malpe's penalty, I actually found it quite amusing given this is the guy that loved that crying celebration that kind of went backfired on him. Uh, Salah's goal was clearly offside. Jota scored a fantastic goal. Um, but again, Brighton just don't give up, do they? No, especially at home. You know, they, they, they play good football, Brighton. You know, 
they have got a, a solid team. They play good football and they give people a good game there. You know, every every decision was when was was correct. You know that uh, the penalty. It was a bit weird because it was the exact same one that they got about three weeks before. You know, he's quite clear. He, he, on, you know, on the naked eye, as it's playing, you can't really see it. But when you slow it down, you can quite clearly see him. He boots his foot. And you can see he's out of control because it's his right foot. So he's just swinging it. So you can see he quite clearly boots him. Yes, Welbeck makes a lot of it, but he's probably right with so because he probably hurt them a little boot right on the end of the toe. So, yeah, I don't, he's just lost the plot. You know, Ollie was, had the same argument a few weeks ago, and, and funny enough, it was Des Kelly. But, you know, they have the, 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 the interview a bit bit better there. But, yeah, Klopp just he seems to have like a little bit of a Kevin Keegan moment. Then he just like, Paul Des was like, he ended it well, to be fair. Brilliant. No, I agree. I agree. Uh, before we talk about the, <laughs> the Jurgen Klopp incident, as you just mentioned, let's quickly talk about Brighton because I think they were absolutely fantastic. They were unfortunate not to beat United. They hit the bar how many times? Four, five times? And again... Well, it went turn, to like 98, 99th minute, wasn't it? They scored. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They, they would have got a draw had they not been for that. So they got a draw against Liverpool and that was without their best fullback or their best player this season, Lamptey, who's been absolutely immense. And we spoke about him a few weeks ago, actually, when we were comparing him and and uh, James at Chelsea. But uh, Steve, when you look at Brighton's system, they played like a four, sorry, three, four, two, one. Um, kind of expecting to pack the midfield anyway, given Liverpool's Gagan press, as, as they like to call it. But I think Ben White, Lewis Stunk and, and Webster were absolutely fantastic at centre-half. I know that Liverpool playing balls over the top, but at the same time, it's almost as if, you know, they really, really blocked Liverpool out, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And I don't know Graham Potter at all. Um, I know his, his bio, um, his history. But you do get the feeling he's evolving. I've seen a massive evolvement in the last 12 months in football across Europe. And I'm seeing certain teams and managers with their identities not budging, not coming off plan and not getting any better. But, you know, you can take your eye off Brighton. They're obviously far away, a different part of the country. Um, you don't see them too much uh, whilst you're following your own team. And then you watch them again next time. And, and, and the, the, they're very, very refreshing. They've got attacking players. They've got strength. The players are a good age. There's no silliness about the manager. There's no ill discipline in the team. Um, they've got... Um, maverick players that that sometimes spend a bit of time on the bench has impact, but they're a good team, and I think they actually enjoy their their status in the Premier League of about six or seventh from bottom, uh, trying to get upwards, but not really fearing being around the bottom bottom three or four slots. And I think there's a freshness about them where they take everyone on and and, and have a really good game of football against against them with obviously a, a bit of football courtesy in terms of defending. But actually, a real, a real open-mindedness about about how to attack and and be creative. I think they're really good to watch. Yeah, and a team that relies on their home support to get behind them. A team that hasn't spent much money in the summer, and uh, they're on ten points. Whereas another team further north uh, are struggling. But we'll talk about Sheffield United <laughs> later on. Actually, um, okay, we we can't not discuss Jurgen Klopp and Des Kelly. Yeah. I didn't watch that incident live. I saw it later on on, on social media. And um, the first thing that got to me was when Jurgen Klopp congratulated Des Kelly um, for oh. James Milner's injury, which yeah. I don't know. And look, the way I see it, he was bang out of order. Um, yeah. I, I don't know why he decided to take it out on Des Kelly. Maybe it was just like a heat of the moment thing. And Des Kelly was the first person to question him because I think BT were the first to, to get the interviews, weren't they? So he decided to take it out on, on the poor bloke. But Des held his own, didn't he, Rod? <laughs> yeah, he did. He probably, he probably got experience from it because, like I said, a few weeks before, because Ollie was, was, was on one. And he kept on ranting on about it, which is rightly so. He's looking after his players. But, yeah, when he was... Uh, like you, like you said there, congratulating him about James Milner. It was just totally over the top. But, you know, some people are, are not very good losers. So, and, you know, not many people are good losers, but some people take it better than others. You know, you can't win them all. And, and, and Brighton rightly has so got got the result they, they deserve because the, the play in the second half deserved that. So, yeah, it was a blatant penalty. And you, you can understand his argument, but what's you got to do with Des Kelly? He's just doing his job. It's nothing to do with him. It's 
speak to his CEOs and speak to his fans that often they get paid for it. That's all, it's all down to them. It's not uh, Des Kelly, but like I said before, he ended it well. Well, this is it. Des Kelly was actually saying to him, you know, you need to speak to your chief executive about this because the the Premier League have these slots and then they sell them to the highest bidder, don't they? So BT Sports and Sky Sports or whoever is going to take the, the viewing rights to that. Um, but it's the CEOs and the chief executives that agree to these deals. So it's not really down to the broadcaster, in effect, really. If they don't want to purchase that slot, then they won't purchase it. But I just think that Klopp is barking up the wrong tree. And to be fair, I can see his argument because he's getting a lot of injuries. But at the same time, I think, again, he should really be aiming his anger to the powers that be at the club because, let's be 100% honest, apart from Jota, who they spent big money on this summer, and Simikas, who else have they really brought in to, to bolster that squad? And with the injuries that they're getting now, he's really struggling. I think he's feeling the pressure. Steve, I know you've got some... Well, Gone. Yeah, yeah, for me... Is... Sorry, go on, Steve. You sure? I just think yeah, that uh, it was patronising from, from Jurgen Klopp. It was condescending. Uh, possibly the first mistake was Des Kelly asking the question... Uh, and then answering it for himself because he said the first question he said was and an injury to James Milner uh, hamstring now I suppose it was an answered question and uh, Jurgen Klopp just with, with the big grin said oh yeah congratulations as if to say yeah you, you know it's quite obvious well done but so there's a big miss here for me I think very quickly uh, he realised that Des Kelly was standing on his two feet strong uh, and he was in deep water Jurgen Klopp because he was making himself look more and more silly Let's not forget here, he, full of adrenaline, he took Roy Keane on and got it wrong. Um, he only heard one word as soon as he put the cans on. At the, uh, at the post-match interview, he just heard sloppy, where Roy Keane had spent six or seven minutes suggesting how Liverpool were clear title favourites, great performance, uh, deserved victory, but a little bit sloppy at times, keeping the scoreline tight. He only heard the word sloppy and ripped his head off, well tried, failed. Uh, he did it last year when City beat him 4-0 at the Etihad. It was a really spiky interview afterwards. And I think there's something amiss here. You know, we're talking about a player here. Uh, James Milner was the injury and a hamstring. It's his fourth strain in the last 12 months. He is 35 years in January, 35 years old. Uh, he's now in a stop start of his career in terms of impact and what he can deliver a team. And when it starts, he has to come on and play and perform for probably the highest sprinting team in Europe. That's got nothing to do with a scheduled game of 12.30. Um, this, is, this is someone who's nearly, just after Christmas, 35 years of age, sadly. It happens to us all. It happens to everybody. Um, and, you know, I, I really thought he was barking up the wrong tree. And like I say, I think he swam out too far and got it wrong. And uh, in, interestingly enough, it's the only time Liverpool have dropped points after a Champions League game and been 12-30 because they've had maximum points and took a lucky point Saturday. So I think he should just get on the coach and go back to Merseyside and get on with the next game instead of trying to shoot uh, a really honest presenter down who's come out of it fantastically well. And not many people knew Des Kelly uh, the day before, possibly... Um, you know, uh, little bits and pieces around, and 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 but for what he actually did and standing up to Jurgen Klopp, I bet there's not a lot do that. He did it fantastically well, and he has my full respect. You know what? You made a good point there about um, James Milner's injury record. But how many injuries? How many strains has it been? I don't know. I mean, we, that's, that's one we, we we can check. But just just the you know just the case in point. You know, he was talking about, I had to take Robbo off. You don't have to take him off, you, you yeah. know. See, um, see, see, this is it, Steve. I mean, uh, as far as I'm aware, the last three injuries that have kept James Milner out of Liverpool's team have all been hamstring injuries. Now, I don't know if it's the same leg. Um, so it's, that might be a little bit of a problem, maybe a, a recurrence. I don't know. But at the same time, as you mentioned, he's 35 years old. He's played a lot of games. I mean, he's been playing at a top level since what, 16 at Leeds. Absolutely. So and you could be you could be teetotal all you want, but you get to 35, and when you're coming on for Liverpool and you've got to sprint those distances that they demand that get them those trophies, which has been amazing for them, you are any any 35 year old is likely after certainly after that unlucky first strain is likely to do it again, and in this case, again and again, it's got nothing to do with the TV scheduling for me. Yeah. I don't know, Rod. 
the, this whole situation, um, we can go on for days on end about this, to be fair, because we've seen so many Liverpool players dropping like flies. OK, granted, the the Van Dijk injury... Oh, but still, it happens. It happens in the season last year. They, you know, you have to... We say in football, you, you need your little bit of luck. Last year, they didn't have really big in, big injuries with, with a, not a massive squad. And now it's it's kind of catching up with them with this pandemic, lack of pre-season and the attention that they play at. You know, it, it's it, all right, the Van Dyke one is it was a bad tackle, but the rest are well intensity training, too intense training, you know, it, it, it catches up with you in the end, like says says and like he says he's thirty five, he's played since he was sixteen at a high level, and you just can't keep doing it. Stop and start, stop and start. And it's, it's catching up with him and it'll catch up with the rest of them because I'm pretty sure the training's pretty intense as well. So, you know, where's the rest period from the internationals is just a total a mess, mess up. It probably doesn't help at all with them playing two or three games in the space of, what, seven to ten days. Then they've got to fly back and they've got to deliver to them, fly to Brighton. It's, all, well, it's, it's a lot of travelling. And, and Ced will tell you that the travelling is what knackers you out. It just, I don't know why it does, but it, it just does. And it takes a lot out, out of you. I don't know why. It, it, it just does. And it does catch up with you. What do you reckon, Steve? Is it the travel that's got something to do with it? Because I, the way I see it, and again, this is just me not being a pro footballer, ever playing football at any high level. It's like, I know it's like when you go to the airport, you've got to check in, you've got to get on the plane, you fly, you, you get off, you wait for your suitcases, you go. I mean, this is just me as a, a normal economy fly here, but I take it these footballers, they have everything done for them, No. Yeah, they do. Uh, it's just time confusing. But, uh, you know, there will have been Liverpool players, for instance, slept in three different beds over seven days. But like, you know, so what? It's like they get, you know, King's Ransom, you know, in a salary. They get, they get the adulation. Connie, you see? The, la- the manager, the lad, is, is largely now decided, you know, Amongst the, the population, that he's the best coach in the world, or or certainly in the in the in the top two or three. So you you know you've got to go and prove it. You've got to keep proving it time and time again. And like I said, the, the travel, you know, those lads will have slept in three different beds last week for Liverpool, and they would not been away. Uh, they'll have not been at home too much. But you get paid a king's salary for it. A huge huge uh, adulation by by the world, and it's, it's simply because they didn't win the game. He'll it, he'll have said. A similar complaint had they have won the game, but he'll have done it with a little bit more grace, I think. So uh, hopefully he can learn from it because I don't think he came across great at all. No. Well, the thing is, this summer they, they sold over to Wolves. They sold Brewster. Lalana, 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 I can't even say his name. Lalana went on a free to Brighton. Uh, Nathaniel Klein left. Who else left? Just on, just on Lovren. Just on style, obviously, he walked on the pitch and walked back on ex Liverpool. So, you know, he's got a history of hamstring strains as well, even though he's wearing the blue kit of Brighton now. But it certainly started in a Liverpool shirt. So, um, you know, there's something that they might look at. But uh, it's all part and parcel for me of being world champions, Premier League champions, European champions. You've just got to, you've just got to ride it out, and they get so much budget to increase their squad and they've done it brilliantly they've done it with Jota who's gone straight in the team and looks like he's been there for seasons it's just part and parcel of the job and uh, you know there are 91 other clubs would swap with Liverpool I'm sure yeah well at the risk of me turning into a porky pig again and trying to pronounce Lalana um, do you think he's even more frustrated that Thiago isn't getting any minutes because he's been on the sidelines for a couple of weeks now yeah and he's out till January I think isn't he now really yeah I think he's out till January uh Possibly, I think the goalkeeper's out tomorrow night for the Champions League. Um, obviously, the, you can't allow for, you know, legislate for the injury to Van Dijk. Um, all in all, there are people stepping up all the time. Jordan Henderson never fails to disappoint me and coaches and managers all seem to pick him and love him and teammates. So, you know, I thought possibly it might be his time up with the signings, um, but he just keeps, you know, stepping up to the plate. They've got they've got more than enough. They've got more than enough. Um, but obviously that 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 centre half and centre midfield position they ideally wanted to strengthen to set the club forward. But they're just going to have to find another way. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Rod Everton lost to Leeds one uh, nil, a result which 
I wouldn't say surprise many because Leeds have been keeping clean sheets uh, pretty well recently, haven't they? Got a clean sheet against Arsenal, got a clean sheet against Everton, obviously. I know they've got hiding against Leicester and Crystal Palace, but Leeds are very good going forward. But what's happened to Everton all of a sudden? One minute they're in contention for top four, apparently, and then next minute they're uh, sliding down the table. Yeah, I don't know. They started so well, and then obviously with Charleston getting injured, and then they couldn't win a game without him, then obviously he comes back and they win a game. But obviously this Leeds is all, you know, Leeds have surprised a few this year, and they'll, they'll continue to do that until someone cottons on. Or try to, I, I don't know, I don't know. It's, it's, they're, they're a strange team, Leeds, really, because not really any standout stars, but as a, a, they're a great team, if you watch them, all of them know them the job. They're very, very, very well coached. And, you know, it's the same with Everton. They're very well coached, but it was just Leeds. It, it was one of them that was either going to be a 1-0 either way, and, and Leeds ended up with it. It was a good away win for them. Steve, have you been impressed with Leeds this season? I mean, to be 100% honest with you, mate, I saw them in the Championship last year and the year before under Bielsa and I honestly believe that perhaps they didn't have as much in the tank to cope with the intensity of the Premier League. But that being said, they've more than held their own. Yes. Uh, and again, I shouldn't try and predict the future, but I'm expecting burnout. Uh, but I think they'll amass enough points and credibility to, to have a good season, regardless if, if that happens or not. Um, I don't think they'll score enough goals, very much reliant on on Bamford. But at the moment, you know, you go to places like Goodison Park and win and, you know, keep a clean sheet and, and nick something. Uh, but it, it, it's amazing. It was it was it was absolutely brilliant. But I think there's a shelf life um, to a club of that that status this year coming back into the Premier League to keep doing that on the road. And I think they'll they'll level out and possibly go backwards a little bit and um I think they'll be absolutely fine. But for the moment, it's a real, really refreshing project that you're seeing from afar and uh, and good luck to them. And they're doing it without, you know, we support our own teams, but we all know what Ellen Road is like. Uh, a cauldron, the atmosphere, it's, it's amazing. And you just think what, you know, 45,000, you know, getting behind them would also do to galvanise their, their, their points and their performances. So uh, you could say that about a lot of teams, if not all of them, but that club in particular they've not actually had the Premier League experience yet uh, under this manager, those supporters, where obviously the other clubs, when they do go back and get full stadiums again, they're going back to what they know. Leeds, it'll just be, everything will just be new again and it'll just be amazing for them. Mm, absolutely. And Rod, Rod, Rafinha's goal, some strike, eh? Yeah, very good. You know, to, to the time as well, it was, it was late on, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great. I'd, I'd rather win one 0 than five 0 away from home. It's a great result. It's a good one. Good team <laughs> boosting. It is though. It's, you know, it's, it's a tight game. You, you've kept a clean sheet and you've nicked a, uh, I don't know, an away goal to win one 0 it's, it's, it's a great result. It's great for team team boost. Okay, so what about Tottenham's draw against Chelsea then? Is that a great result for Spurs? Because let's be honest, we knew that Jersey was wasn't gonna. I'm gonna say I wasn't gonna say part the bus because that's a bit rubbish to say. Because I know that Spurs are more than that. Uh, but at the same time, he had a game plan, didn't he? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, that's his game plan. Just sniffle Chelsea. Just absolutely snuffle just the life out of football and just kill the game and just try and get a, a, a moment of brilliance from Kane or Bale late on. You know, he's happy as Larry coming away there with a nil-nil. We saw his face at full ball. time, didn't you? I did. <laughs> you saw his I face at full time, didn't you? Yeah, we've seen it before. We've seen it how many times United that kind of performance. But that's, you know, but you, you can't grumble with him because, you know, he's top the league. He's battered us. He's battered uh, City. So, you know, he's, he's got something going there at, at, at Tottenham. But, yeah, it was a, it was a ball, absolute snooze fest. Mm. You know, after the, the Man City game, I saw people on social media saying, oh, that's a Jose Mourinho masterclass. It's, it's almost like a cliche now. But for me, that, no, wasn't, that, wasn't, that wasn't a Jose Mourinho masterclass. Yesterday or Sunday or whenever, yes, yes, yesterday wasn't it? Sunday, yeah, that was a Jose Mourinho masterclass. That is what he does best. Yeah, well, well, you know, he's, 
his history telling he, he, he wins a lot of games so I think he usually come away with a win and that'd be a, a Jose masterclass but yeah we've seen them games multiple times at United and wherever where else has he been but you know he's called the special one for a reason he's doing a good job at the minute it's something you can't really grumble with it but like I say not an enjoyable watch at all mm. Steve that full time Frank Lampard was very uh, I don't know he was very complimentary of his players you're saying that they played a, a good game they worked hard the energy levels were there but the finishing wasn't now is that aimed at Tammy Abraham or Timo Werner or perhaps Giroud who came on and he had a great chance at the end um, yeah, they, they did, but I think everybody alluded to the fact that uh, Chelsea had, you know, large spells in the game, but uh, Tottenham with Mourinho blocked off all the areas um, to invade the middle of the penalty area uh, with white shirts, and obviously that made the ball go wide. So Chelsea had more crosses than Rodri's football coupon on a Saturday. It was like, it was just, it was one after the other was coming into the box and it's not a choice of scoring in the Premier League these days. It's a lot of tippy tapping around the box and a little setup for a, a strike in the box. Tottenham weren't going to allow to do it. There was a lot of crosses coming in. I think people suggesting Giroud should have come on a bit earlier because uh, he's probably better than Tammy Abram at attacking a cross, but it just shows you how difficult it is to, to score from a cross at pace around six foot four centre half and past a world class goalkeeper. So I think Giroud obviously was a, a lobbed effort that he thinks he should have done better with. Um but there was no easy chances for Tottenham to sorry for Chelsea to score on Saturday. So I don't think you could really have too much of a go at the forwards because the likelihood the goal was going to come from across and that's difficult to do. Fair enough. Now we've got a question from the Facebook group page, believe it or not, and Mike has asked can only Spurs stop Spurs from winning the title? No. No? No, there's not going to be... Um, it's not going to get to that point for me because I agree with Roy Keane that you know Liverpool and Man City are better than Spurs. Um, the, the wheels won't come off, off... You know The back legs of Spurs won't go or anything like that. The bottle won't go. They won't be called bottle jobs, brides, bridesmaids. And that word that's come into football uh, lingo this year that they're a bit spursy mm. uh, I don't think it'll happen uh, I don't think he'll allow it I think they'll stay resilient I think they'll stay honest I, th I think they'll stay competitive and I actually think they'll stay brilliant I really do Rodri said before you know you know we're still waiting for Bale to get in the team and do his bits can you expect to go course and distance Son is excellent and everybody else will be you know safe in structure um, they will remain that from pillar to post, in my opinion. They just won't be as good as Liverpool or Man City in May. OK. Rod? Um, just touching on what says. So that depends on what what kind of bail uh, turns up and do we see the best of him? Do it, do, is, it, is it, you know, does he stay injury-free? But I can't agree with says. You know, the, the, the better teams are City but, and Liverpool, but, you know, with their injury woes, you know, once Mourinho gets a, his nose in front, it's difficult to, to, to peg back, especially it's, it's just a worry if they, if they have too many draws because, you know, if a game's like yesterday, you know, it's just not going to be enough because uh, Liverpool and City won't lose many. OK, fair enough. Well, before we move on, can we just quickly talk about Gareth Bale? Because I saw a lot of people yesterday on, on social media saying, well, why isn't Gareth Bale getting games this and that? And the way I see it, he really hasn't played that many games for Real Madrid in the past year. So they can't expect him to come straight into the Spurs first team with the intensity that the Premier League demands. Steph, I mean, Steph, uh, last week he played 180 minutes. He played a full game up for Wales, first game, and then he played 60 minutes. Yeah, but what, like I, what, 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 what I was getting at, what I was about to say was, you know, I think uh, Mourinho is using him sparingly because come the back end of the season, when the injuries are mounting up, and obviously now with COVID, whenever a player gets symptoms, they've got to self-isolate for two weeks. So they're out for at least two games. So I don't think he's chucking them in from the start because he's like, well, I'm, I need this player. I need him to stay fit. And I can't continuously play him like he's doing with Son, like he's playing with, uh, with Kane, for example. I don't know. That's what I think. I think he's just using him sparingly. 
this is why I'm saying to when if he gets his nose in front, he's, he's very experienced. He, you know, he's probably experienced. Kane is going to get injured at some point, and he can't really afford to have both of them injured. So he, he's wrapping in cotton wool, like you're like saying, and just fit part using him. You know, he, he's well capable of coming off the bench and, and getting a world yesterday. So that was what he was probably hoping on, and that's what he's hoping on when it's tight games. But yeah, he may, he may be possibly doing that, and it's probably be wise to do that. Okay, brilliant. Right, let's talk about United and Arsenal. Now, a few weeks ago, it was Solskjaer's job is on the line and Arteta safe. And now it's kind of gone the other way now because Arsenal lost to Wolves 2-1. United came from 2-0 down to beat Southampton 3-2. Something's happened with Cavani off the field, but which another thing that we can obviously discuss. Steve, I wasn't surprised at all that Wolves got that win against Arsenal. Arsenal being... Bereft of ideas, they've been so, I wouldn't even say pragmatic, they've been so negative. They only scored one goal in open play for, what, 740-odd minutes prior to yesterday's game. Um, The writing was on the wall, wasn't it? But before we discuss the actual game itself, the injury to Jimenez, absolute shocker, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And obviously, there's a lot said about it, about the protocols now, and obviously... Um, be great if you listen to your podcast still, but you know, extend everybody's wishes in hoping he gets a speedy recovery. Um, it'd be great if he if he heard that from us because you, you know you have to. Your heart goes out to to anybody in that moment, um, and I think obviously he'll be now the the benchmark of of how to improve things when you know in terms of head injuries moving forward. I think it can get better from this point. Uh, and he's straight to North London Hospital for, for surgery. So we wish him well with that. Uh, but it, yeah, it, it was horrific. And it just adds to the current debate that is going across, certainly England and further, about the dementia with the older players, certainly, you know, the Manchester United old guard, um, you know, and, and others. Uh, Dave Watson suffering with it, ex-England and Manchester City. And it just adds to the, the, the head injuries. Um, and I think it will be tapered. I think it will be tailored down. And um, I think we'll possibly see as we go forward following football still, I think we'll see a, a change, certainly grassroots up into the professional game in terms of uh, what goes on in heading. You can't take crossing and heading out the game because it's such a, a, a big thing. But uh, it just adds to the current, current conversation about it. And uh, it was a well, I was going to say I saw one, but, you know, you, you really did feel for him. You heard the noise and it was sickening, really. So we wish him all the best with that. Yeah, Rod is wincing already. Um, yeah, just, just the noise in it, mate. I've heard it before. It was just, yeah, it was, how David Luiz let him carry on is just ridiculous. Well, yeah, because a lot of people were saying that Arsenal, well, in fact, Arsenal put a statement to say that they followed the, the concussion protocol. Now, this goes back to something you and I discussed, I think, last season, Rod. If a player gets a head injury, just take them off straight away. Take them off. Don't even think about testing well, them on the pitch. Just you know, take them that, off. Yeah, well, I think it's something with the powers to be as well. They should have a real set in place where, you know, uh, an emergency sub for 10 minutes or, you know, it's, it's should be the well-being of the player because like Des touched on there, there's players that are suffering now and, you know, something has to be done probably at an age level where you can't head it at a certain age and, and it's up until you get to a certain age because, yeah, it's not something we, 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 it's something we want to stamp out and, you know, it's, I think the powers of being to set a rule in place or, you know, because, you know, I've seen Alan Shearer go say, you know, he should have been much. There's a picture of him as a bandage around his head. He's got a bandage around his wrist. And the only telling me, tell the physicals are going to say, come on, you've got to come off. He's going to go, all right. You've got to be out of the power to take this, to, to throw over the other players. The player's not going to want to come off. I won't want to come off. You're not going to want to come off. But you've got to take that power out of the player and just say, that's the rules and off you come. Mm. You're going to laugh at this, but I seem to remember an interview with The Undertaker talking about wrestling Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania and he got concussed in the opening 10 minutes of the bout and he doesn't remember the next 20. Is he taken to hospital? He just didn't even remember his name. There's repercussions of that later in life. It must be. Well, of course. You've got dementia, you've got Alzheimer's, you've got all sorts of... You you saw in America... them so, wrestlers, they're all, they're all walking with 15 canes or walking sticks. They're all going to be natural when they come to this day. Mm. So, 
you know, we don't want the footballers getting dementia or getting all kinds of stuff because they're um, head in the football. They need to be protected. And well, we that's s- the powers that be, the FA or whoever needs to talk. Well, we saw with that American footballer, they did a documentary on Netflix, wasn't it? What's his name? Rodriguez? Hernandez, sorry. Uh, Hernandez. H- Hernandez. Yeah. Well, you can do that. The head that, that you could see, the brain, how it had shrunk, mm. and the guy yeah. was only like 24, 25. So he said he should have. His brain should 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 be like that at the age of like forty five, and he was like twenty five. So it is a problem. It's something needs to be look, looked at. But you know, That's... American football is a bit more violent and a bit more. So well, they do use the head a lot more. Gentlemen, I just think as well. Maybe uh, I've only just thought of it now, but maybe a rule could be put in that if there is a head injury, you could have a um, a rotating sub, just one. Um, so instead of the player. Playing on, playing on immediately, coming off twenty minutes later. You know, David Luiz getting on with it, then coming off. You know, maybe if you just had a rotating sub, just one, which allows the head injury to get immediate attention. And if all well and good, he can come back on the field, then fine. And the rotating sub then goes back and sits down. But what the player had, who's had the original head injury, has had immediate attention rather than 20 minutes of not feeling well, I'm not sure if I'm all right, yeah, I'm okay, physio, so on and so forth. So moving forward, usual substitutions, but allowed to rotate one for a head injury, which allows the player to come back on if he's fine, but gets immediate attention straight at the scene. Well, the thing is, Steve, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, right? Surely Arteta is to blame for this now. And hear me out on this. David Luiz sustained that injury prior to Wolves taking the lead. In fact, both of Wolves' goals came in the first half, right? Yeah. Came after he sustained that injury. Now, if they'd have taken David Luiz off and brought on holding or whoever was available, then it would be fair to say that possibly those goals could have been prevented? Yeah. Yeah, there is that. There is that. Um, And that just adds to the Arteta woe at the moment, which will be levelled at him uh, per defeat um, moving forward still because obviously he's, he's, he's right under pressure now from, you know, Arsenal are never shy with the Arsenal TV, one of the first to, to do it and, and, and be the loudest with it, um, you know, to, to moan at the managers and, and get a new Messiah and probably the, the hope that kills you, they thought they had one with the, with the Wembley Cup finals victories and uh, being uh, Pep Guardiola's assistant and the next player and, and a really slick operator he looks. But uh, what's happening now, they've lost their identity again and um, it'll all end up, sadly, back with the manager. I mean, I saw a programme the other night and there was uh, three young Arsenal players all sat there and uh, it was a quiz and I thought, oh, I'll be interested to see if I can keep up with these lads. But when I realised it wasn't about football and it was a quiz about grime and, 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 and gangster <laughs> rapping and things like that. And... Um, you know they were they were celebrating and I thought it's it's all right you you've got to have a different life beyond you know away from the game but when you're doing it on in on the camera you're there to be absolutely hammered when it go when it goes wrong and it just takes away you don't have to be a football obsessive like us but they just look like they're just messing about uh you know they've had history of it in the past again I keep mentioning Roy Keane he's highlighted that they they're always six packs and selfies and, and they're very, very soft. He even said how soft they were at weekend, but they're losing their identity that they're absolutely um, 24 hours a day footballers, which is a bit robotic, but the best are. The thing is, Steve, to, to counter that, I think that's what the club wants. I think from a social media perspective, they want the players to behave like that, especially the younger ones, because they appeal to a certain demographic, a younger generation. And on top of that, it gets views. Views means they can get more advertisers, you get more corporate sponsorships. And and that's just the way it goes. And I think you and I had a discussion similarly yesterday about um, XG. You know, yeah. the, the, the game has gone and we can we can like speak it. of that later. <laughs> but, but, you know. but still, the, the same programme that I watched, there was a young flyer uh, entrepreneur, if you like, and he, he was talking about the marketing and the two names he said was Paul Pogba and Deli Alley. You know, they're the, the, the market for, for the young, you know. And I'm sat there thinking, neither of them are in the team. So it's a football programme. You know, everything's around football and you two... Um, you know, ones that you're highlighting to you illuminate to 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 catch the eye, 
don't get picked by the managers. And you can throw Jesse Lingard into that as well. All the mm. ones who mess about to attract the youngsters aren't in the team. Yeah. Well, they've got the Adidas boot deals. They've got the same agent. So, right. yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, let's talk about this game then, Rod. Uh, Wolves, well worth the victory. First half, I, I think, wasn't that the first time they scored in the first half this season? I'm not sure, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the first time they scored in the in the first half this season. But again, well worth the victory and Arsenal toothless again. Yeah, it surprised me because, you know, after you were talking about a, a few weeks ago, I was saying, I said to him, you can see what he's doing, he's doing, he's doing well. But since the United game, they've just literally thought the, the wheels are fell off. He's probably listened to Joaquin more because he's probably was right at the time saying, you know, you need to not get overly over the top, which we did and, and, and he didn't. And obviously he was right because, yeah, they're struggling at the minute. And, you know, let's not forget, well, we'll give Wolves credit a bit. You know, they're a decent side and they played well, like you said. But, you know, Arsenal at home, you'd expect them to play a lot better. But, yeah, it's, it's not looking good at the minute. What are they, 10th, 11th? So, you know, Tottenham look around the corner. So, yeah, but I, I agree with Roy, though. I think we'll stay up. <laughs> Look at this guy. <laughs> um, Steve, <laughs> in, in, interestingly enough, Wolves won, yeah. playing four at the back. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I know Connor, I, you know, I've not spoken to him for a while now, probably since he's really, really hit the straps and become an England goal-scoring captain, Connor Cody, but... He was a centre midfield player through Liverpool's academy who I worked with at Huddersfield, who everybody almost, you know, in, in the background, what a what a young professional, what a personality, what a good lad. He'll end up at the back, though. Um, so we always thought it would be in a back four because nobody played in back three. So I'm not surprised to see him there. Then he's gone to Wolves. He's got this hand in glove trust with the manager, the supporters and the formation. And he's just grown into this man, this Premier League. Well, oh, it's got to be in the top six centre halves in a back three. I've taken over uh, Maguire. Yeah, absolutely. And the Prem took over Stones. That's a fact. Um, in, 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 in the last 12 months. And now he's now going to be, um, looks like, on the back of a victory, that they'll stay with a back four for a bit. Obviously, there are other players as well. They've got flying fullbacks. They've got a good goalkeeper. Uh, they're really they've got protection in front. But I think this will take Conor Cody to the next level. Now I think he'll be marking bodies rather than space. I don't think he'll be able to pass those amazing diagonal balls right and left that he can do as the spare defender. So he'll have less time on the ball. But I think this will really, really improve his 1v1 defending now because he'll have more to do, he'll have more body contact, more duels and I think the main benefactors after Wolves will be England going into the tournaments in the next couple of years. I think it's uh, I think it's great for Wolves, great for Connor and the beauty of it all is still they've just won with it, they'll probably run with it now for a bit but they know they can go back to a back three at a click of a fingers at any point and the lads will probably just be able to revert to type so they've got two ways of defending and winning I think it's I think it was great coaching by uh, what appears to be a great coach at Wolves. Yeah, see, the thing is, with Wolves losing Jimenez now, I'm not sure if Cody will be able to hit those diagonal balls as much as he'd like because he's known to drop deep, flick mm. a ball and hold it up. And I don't know if Wolves actually have that kind of target man at the moment. I, I think Fabio Silva came on. He did OK. Did he score Fabio Silva? I think Fabio Silva did he score. Yeah. No, it's Pudence, Pudence and Pedro Neto, sorry. Yeah. But, you know, Pudence is a half-decent player, but he's more like a playmaker more than anything. So can you see Nuno possibly going in the transfer market in January to bring in an emergency striker, at least on loan, until Jimenez does return eventually? Yes. Yes, I think he's earned the right now to go to a chairman, an owner, and say... Phew. Mendes. Where, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, look where look where we were, look where we are, look where I think we can be. I think he's developed that trust now. If he wants, no, there, I know they've just lost Jota. Jota. Um, I'm sure he's in a position now to ask for some help to Im improve the squad. He must be. He must be in credit. And any names? Does who do you think? Um, oh, I don't know. At, the, at the, what? It'd be hard to replace him. And as if it's like to like. Um, I don't know. I'll have a think while, while we're all chatting. I'll think of somebody on the cusp of somebody's team, but you know, it probably could be from a, from abroad because 
You know, I think there's only Connor Cody who's the English player, mostly. So you tend to think they don't buy British, but uh, Josh it's King, a Bournemouth. Who? King, could be Bournemouth. Could, easily, yeah, good one. Yeah, could could be quite quite easily, quite easily. I'll get one before the end of the show, mate. Mm. Yeah. There's a player called Darwin Nunez at Benfica. Um, he's only just burst on the scene. I think he's like 21 years old. Um, done pretty well this season, I think. Um, well, I think they signed him. Yeah. In fact, they signed him. In, they signed him at the beginning of this season, so I don't think they'll be able to sell him. But he's half decent player. Scored, I think he scored against Glasgow Rangers. If memory serves me correct. Well, they've got pretty good connections, so they've got a good field to look at. Look at. Oh, Benfica, hundred percent, hundred percent. Unless they go for the uh, the Porto striker, but anyway, well, um, you know, it's not difficult. It's not diff- It's not easy to come do what you know. What he's done well because that he, he's you know he's a very good player for them. He does a lot. You know, he can hold it up, he's quick, he's fast, he scores goals. You no, know, they're not don't go on trees and No, I agree. I agree. All right, quick question from the Facebook group page. Mike has also asked, was winning the FA Cup the best thing to have happened to Arteta, but the worst thing to happen to Arsenal? Go on, Rod. Um, no, it, it can never be a bad thing to win the FA Cup. You know, it's a massive trophy, it's, it's a great memory. A lifetime, so I just don't agree with that. And no, I, just, you know, it's, it's, you know, when we say when Ali got the job, when Arteta got the job, you know, these are massive jobs. You need to give them a lot, of, a, a, you know, at least two or three years. What's Arteta a year, year bit down the, down the line? You still need to get rid of the drip that's, that's still there. So you still got to give him time. But you know, probably the knives are out and the idiots are out. Arsenal TV, so. You've got to be wary, and he's got to get better performances. You know, I against United at Old Trafford. That was a high, intensely good performance. And, and since then, like I said, they've, they've kind of dipped. But no, I don't agree with that. You know, FA Cup's a massive trophy. If, if you win that, it's, it's good for you and the club. And yeah. Okay, well, Steve. Can I, can I ask? Can I ask you both a question? Go on. We only we hear of the salary. We hear it's possibly around about three hundred thousand, and we don't know um, any trouble that goes on. Um, you know, any unrest around the training ground. But uh, bearing in mind where Arsenal are at the moment, you know, I'm sure every supporter is saying this to each other. So I'm going to say it to, to you two: Would you restructure your plan? Uh, basically, rip it up and start again. Um, and go into the training ground and, and start with a conversation, then a training session, and then put the team up. And would you pick Ozil? Rod, do you want to answer that first? <laughs> um, Obviously, their most creative player. I'm sure Lacazette is probably saying, everyone's looking at me to score, but the best assist partner as a teammate in the last five, seven years is Ozil in Europe. His his assists are up there with the best. So if you're a striker, when you don't score, you look at your service often. You have a look at yourself and think, I could be a yard quicker. I need to train hard this week. I'm a little bit off it. But you look backwards at your teammates and go, I'm not getting a pass. Yet you've got the best assister at that club in Europe, probably going home and not even watching the game. So, would you pick him or not? Uh, I would. I would. You, you, you would me. pick him based on ability and based on his creativity, but I don't think the Arsenal board would want him picked because of the comments that he made about the Chinese. And uh, we all know that right. there's a lot of money but in China. The, but he's, but he's, the, he's, the, he's the manager. He, it, for me, he'd either be down the road or you play him. You wouldn't have a player like that around the place. Mm. You know, it just brings more pressure on or more questions, like the stuff with Joe Willett with his cards, just stuff that they don't need, you know, coming, stuff like that. It just needs to be concentrated on football and none of this crap outside, you know, people tweeting crap. Just concentrate on the football and just bring everyone together and, and the best result is having the best players on the pitch so, and as well as the best players. So, do you, you know, think they're... they're and... Sorry, Roger, do you, do you think they're, they're relying on Martinelli when he comes back? They're putting their eggs in his basket... Well, no, you, well, Abanyang seems he signed his contract to sit some dip. Bit, one bit, goal bit, all bit. season, mate. One goal in the league yeah, all season. No, he seems to be a, a different player. You know, that, that, that can happen. You know, players, 
as the modern world wants to get a, a big paycheck, that's that's it. They're, they're comfortable. Something something changes, and you know they don't have the same hunger, which is sad, but unfortunately it's true. So yeah, well, I, there's a lot of players. There's a lot of players there at the minute are letting the manager down. It's, it's you know the coach is he's a good coach. We know that, but you know some of the Arsenal fans obviously totally disagree. You know it's it's, it's a, a game of opinions, but you know I think he's still got a lot of players to get out and get in. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Rod. I mean, we know he can't really stay fit. He's a great lad, obviously, and, and we kind of like support the Manchester lads. But the two last games with Danny Welbeck for Brighton gets in the Arsenal team, gets in. He gets yeah, his, it's yeah, all his fitness yeah, that's yeah. That, that you know, but you can't rely on it. You can't keep investing in it. I understand that as the business model, you can't keep giving him a contract. But, you know, if it was a pay-as-you-play, I don't know what the, the terms were, but, you know, he's now fit and playing for Brighton. Um, and that goal that he scored, that one-on-one -on -one at Aston Villa, where he basically ran through from the halfway line, there was not a doubt in that anyone's mind he was not going to score, just lifted it over the keeper. He gets in Arsenal's team now, so that's another mess. He looked dangerous against Liverpool as well. Yeah. In, in, in part. Mm. That's right, that's right. Like I say, Bell, they've got... They've got he's, Got, still got a big job on there. He's still got to get a rid of a, a few and still bring in a few. Well, Rod, the, the top goal scorer in the league is like I said with three goals, and he's not even getting anywhere near the team, which is it's it's mind boggling. But anyway, I, th I think we've spoken enough about Arsenal to be honest. Yeah, told we... you, some some players just just don't just some of the coaches and players they just don't they just want their own players in and they just don't fancy them. Mm. And maybe Lacazette's one of them. Yeah, and there seems to be a few of them there. It seems like it. All right, let's talk about United then, Rod. 2-0 down at half-time against Southampton. De Gea's gone off injured, uh, clattered into the post, thanks to Wood Prowse's oh, free kick, which was a fantastic free kick. Was that? No, sorry, go on. Was he, bottled it and didn't he bottled it and didn't fancy it. Yeah? Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, and then on comes Cavani, um, sc <laughs> scores twice, and um, United win the game. Ugh. I don't know where to get, begin with this one because, in all fairness, it wasn't a bad first half display. I think if, if Greenwood put his chance away, then you know it, it would have been a different story. I, but I, to I totally agree. I don't know where people were coming from. There were clear cut chances. Greenwood usually would score them with his eyes closed. Obviously, that's why they brought him up. He doesn't seem like he had a shot in the in the in the first half late on as well, where he's in the middle of the goal and he's just straight at the keeper. Usually, that'd be side netting either side. So there's something not right with him because, you know, like I said before, he's he's the sharpest of sharp what I've seen as a striker, left foot, right foot, and he was a bit off. But when Cavani's come on, you know, Stead will tell you, if you've got movement, the, the crosses were crap, even there was, a, there was a deflective shot, but if you've got movement in and between them and post, you know, his record says it all. He's, he'll score goals for you. You've just got to put the ball in the right area. Rod, I don't know if you remember a couple of seasons ago, we were talking about uh, Marcus Rashford and how I said that he's not a traditional centre forward. And there were people on social media saying to me, well, what are you talking about? And I'm trying to give examples like Van Nistelrooy, Alan Shearer. These are proper goal poachers. The, the, and Cavani, the, world, the world guy who's just been mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, know, I know what you mean. But these people obviously don't understand football and what a number nine is. So, you know, the, the very, very rare... To be honest, these days they, yeah. they're either like Rashford, either or Martial. You know they can't play with a back to goal, so it, it, it's difficult for him. But yeah, Cavani is a traditional number nine, battering ram, one touch, play it, get in the box, score goals. That's that's all his aim is, and yeah. and he'll he'll help the team out and work hard, winning the ball back in his own half. He, you know he's, he's a good player, and it, and it baffles you why he's not really played more to be honest and I think both of his goals they, they weren't just down to instinct that's experience as well I, I wouldn't see an 18 or 19 year old striker do something like especially the, the stooped header for the winner I don't know I don't know what do you reckon Steve also the header that was driven across and it was uh, in no time he flashed and it just went past the far post you know he he knows exactly where the goal posts are obviously the thing that really struck me, Stel, obviously, is a, is a world name, world class. Um, but you don't see that much of him. But uh, it was so refreshing to see his hunger, um, almost intimidating. Um, you know, I don't support Manchester United, but when they wheel out the team, I've got so much respect for who they pick. 
as talent, but none of them really intimidate me in terms of that, you know, like a street fighter mentality, uh, a talisman even. You know, Rodri's just mentioned Rash Rashford and Martial. We know they've got talent, athleticism, but I don't see them as talisman. And when I turn up, you know, watching Manchester City against Manchester United, they don't intimidate me, despite the fact that I respect them and I rate them. But I look at Cavani and I, I, it was like, oh, that was like a United of old player, like a Mark Hughes, a Cantona, uh, just that that player at the end of the pitch that I think gives everybody a lift. Uh, and I felt it, even though I don't support United, I really felt that surge of they've got they've, they've got some here, and I don't feel that with the rest. Yeah, I find it amusing how when Cavani was signed, you're seeing all these people saying, oh, it's, it's Falcao Mark II, yet they didn't realise that Falcao had just come back from an ACL injury. Uh, Cavani hadn't kicked the ball for a few months, so he was fully fit. The circumstances were completely different. And let's be 100% honest, Cavani was still banging in goals before he even left Paris Saint-Germain. So, again, the asinine let's, arguments, let's... the agenda is all over the place. It's brilliant. You know, he, let's get it right. If it wasn't for Mbappe, he would be playing for PSG. And, you know, Mbappe's a world class player. And Cavani, equally, when he comes in, would score goals. You know, he's, he's, anyone who said it was a bad designing doesn't really know what they're talking about because it was just a really an absolute no brainer. I'm surprised no one else. Well, look, Paris Saint Germain decided to sign Icardi and get rid of. Um... Cavani, and we know what's happened there. So, yeah, but he wanted a card. He's all you need from the Milan card. He wanted a bit of the madman, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I actually think, lads, that Manchester United for forever, I've always had somebody at the top end of the pitch which young players look up to. Like I've just said, Cantona, Hughes, even Whiteside at the start. Then he got back. He he became a senior player in midfield, despite being you know obviously playing as a teenager. Then he became you know, a, a, a solid man, a real man. Now, what United have gone with in recent, like the Red Arrows, you know, they've been quick, <clears> been <throat> counter-attacking, they've been very much hit miss or maybe, but what they have been mostly is very, very young. That all of a sudden, just in that, it was more than a cameo, but that 45-minute appearance yesterday, there was a man at the top end of the pitch, which Manchester United have always had. When Larson came, it, it was a man with pedigree. Uh, Berbatov... York, Cole, they're all, they're, even though they were young, they were men. Manchester United have been very, very youthful on the on the front line for three years now. And they finished that game with an absolute elite footballer at the top end of the pitch. But the thing that was obvious to me is they've got a man. And I think the, youth, the young players, some of them are actually still youth players. I think they're going to thrive having someone to look up to in that position. And in the meantime, he's going to score on goals and win in games. I think they've got that figurehead now, I do. Mm. I think well, uh, I think Mason Green would to, to get his to sit next to him in training, learn Babel, try you no know, trying to learn Spanish and just soak everything up because you know he can learn so much from him. No, I agree. I agree. And if you don't learn from a player with his experience, then you're no good as far as I'm concerned. Um I I'm think we had sure, I'm sure I'm sure he will, but you know, he's just like like says says he's just an elite strike. His record says that he's third on the list behind Messi and Ronaldo in goal scores in the last 10, 15 years. So. You, look at, you, look at, you look at Rashford and Martial and Greenwood, they've all done as much as each other, Rod. You look left, you look right. They're, they're all similar players and they're all the similar age. Obviously, Greenwood is, is tender with his age, but they've all pretty much done as much as each other. Rashford has done more for, for England and he's now doing stuff off the field. But then you look at Cavani and you go, this is just something else again. I'm not saying it's going to be like the Cantona influence, but... It's just a world striker who's got who's got age and experience on his side, and uh, I just think there'll be a lot of frightened centre halves in the next few months. Where I don't think there's been too many frightened centre halves in the last few months. You know, let's not forget he's from Uruguay. It's a tough place to come from. You know, he's, it's, 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 Suarez is the same. They're tough as boots there. And they're not going to be scared of anything. No. OK, well, Oli went with a 4-4-2 diamond, didn't he? Um, and I was a bit surprised to see Van der Beek play. Um, let, let's talk about the P word. I'm not, I'm not talking about the one that ends in Y, the one that ends in A, Pogba. Um, not not uh, included in the squad because of an injury. Let's get that one right. He wasn't dropped. He's, he's, he suffered an injury and he hasn't played for the past couple of games. But... Um, 
Mike again has asked, is Pogba's time done at United? Personally, I think he's the reason why Van der Beek came in was to replace Paul Pogba. I don't know about you, Rod. What do you, what do you think? Well, looking at the game again today, it just baffles me how they've not got rid of this bloke and got Jack Grealish. It just, just absolutely baffles me. And someone else is going to end up grabbing this Jack Grealish, and it's just going to be the worst mistake ever because. You know, for me, you know, it's high praise, but he's up there, he's close to got getting close to gathering with this kid. He's, he's he's got everything. So, and no disrespect to Villa, but he needs to be at a bigger platform, and you know, someone eventually is going to take him because he's just getting better and better and better and better. You know, he, he says he wants to play at Peter James, he, he wants to be a United player. You know, we need to make that happen and get Paul Pogba out because Paul Pogba is a myth. He, he wasn't world class in the event. He wasn't world class at Man United. Yes, he's world class at France because he's in a bubble, he's there for a month, he's concentrating on football, he's not doing all the bullshit Instagram and all the other crap with his barnet. He's concentrating on football and you get the results out of it. As a footballer, from season from season to season, he's just he's just not world class at all. He, he in fits and spurts, but that's not world class. World class players consistently game in, game out, season after season, and that's not Paul Pogba. And he's not from Manchester United, so we need to get rid of him. Well, this is it. Is it too much to ask any United fan that loves Paul Pogba and say to him, mate, signed him for £90 million for how long ago? Four years now? Has it been yeah. four years? Four years. Yeah. So in those four years, can you tell me exactly how many stand-up performances he's made? And I know people are going to get at me and say, oh, you're picking on him. But I just need to know because... Going going back, I can think probably City away when we won three two, turned it around. Uh, maybe the Everton away game where he scored. Well, Rashford's been probably Rashford's probably been in the same team. How many stand up forms can you spend that Rashford? You could probably say about five or ten. If you no, the first week Arsenal he scored two goals. Then he scored a goal in his first European game. There were multiple games he's, he's won for United. There isn't a miss. Like I said, it's a miss. He's not a world-class player. He's a world-class player for France. Even at Juventus, I didn't see a world-class player. He world-class potential. But, yeah, it's just, it's just when there's players out there that are, are far better outperforming him uh, and are quite honestly just better players than him, and we, we just need to wipe our hands of it. The state's not working. And it maybe moves on and becomes a better player somewhere else. That can happen. It just doesn't fit. It didn't fit for the first time he's here. And it's not fit the second time. So how long are we going to keep on going? You know, what we're going to do, he's got a year left after this season. What are we going to do, another three, four years? Try and get the best out of him. It's been four years. <laughs> need to, need to you know, cut the cord and move on. Yeah. Steve, I said it back end of, I would say last season, I think it was the back end of the season before, it would be in the best interest of both United and Pogba if he were to go. Um, I still stand by it. I think Pogba cannot flourish at United because he's constantly in and out of the team. He's always got the media on his back. He's got social media jumping on his shoulders and all that. But also it will be good for United because they can recoup some of the money that they spent on him. And on top of that, it, it frees up more wages for, for other players. So everyone's happy in that respect. Even the Pogba fans that support Man United. Yeah, um, I've got to say, I was listening to Rodri there and I thought he was absolutely word perfect in terms of how I see it too. There's nothing left for me to say on it really because he covered it superbly. Uh, I thought he was even struggling Pogba when he was supposedly 100% fit. Um, he could still um, get his name in the paper by taking a penalty or the scoring or missing. Uh, he'd still be on free kicks around the box and he was constantly in your face messing about uh, with Jesse Lingard. I think the club should be have huge credibility for getting rid of the two messes out of the team, out of the squad. I think the main benefactor has been Rashford, who could have easily gone the other way and joined him and been a messer. But now I think he's obviously... Um, you know, a hero on and off the field, not just in Manchester, but across the, 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 the nation. Uh, so credit to that. But he could have easily gone with the messes and been out of the team. So I think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and, and whoever has influenced that, uh, although the performances have influenced it because they don't deserve to be in the team. Um, and again, Rodri just covered, covered it all. Uh, I thought the first comment was brilliant. You know, wipe your mouth, 
Um, you know, there's been great players left Manchester United. You know, we 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 followed them. You know, you did. I, I, you know, but we followed them from afar. Us teams who support other teams, we saw Yap Stam go, we saw Paul Ince go, Brian Robson. We know all the stories. You know, Roy Keane. Um, they go, and uh, you think it's before their time. The manager decides when they go, and this in this instance, it looks like it's running its course now, and they quickly they they they, they get rid, even if it's just done nicely with a handshake. Well done. But he's cost them millions. He's not really repaid them back with too much and just recycle and repair and just go again with a, a good set of players that you've you've kept and keep adding to it if you can. Grealish being being one, I would just get Pogba now, whatever you could out. It's been proven now. The more performances, the spirit that's obviously being shown. Um, I know it's Gary Neville is still trying to find a place for him in his team and you know he's largely on the on the money often, but I don't see it with this one. Get him out of the club, uh, keep go, keep Rashford on the straight and narrow, and get some better players in. And I think you'll be a, an easy easy forgotten memory. Mm. Okay, one more thing before we move on because um, I don't want people to be thinking it's a Man United show or anything. But is Solskjaer the luckiest manager on the planet? One minute he's under immense pressure, and all of a sudden things turn round, and he's he's. Back, fine, as if like nothing's happened. Not for me. He's not lucky for me. I, I think he's the same person. Um, I think he's very, very consistent. I think you've just got to question the integrity of the team still. Uh, the team look like they can turn it on one minute and then they go away in the Champions League and embarrass themselves. And then you, you just feel that there's a watershed moment for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer where there's going to be a difficult game fixture and result, i.e. Everton, i.e. Southampton, and the players just keep keep playing for him and playing for the club. So um, he's not lucky for, for me. He's unlucky that I think he's giving it everything and at times his players let him down because several aren't good enough. But uh, on, a, on a given day like yesterday, they were more than good enough and I think no, I don't. I don't believe he's lucky. No, okay. I believe he's. I believe he's all right. Rod, take a deep breath. No, it's exactly the same. The problem is he's got you know he's got potless pots in the in the in the waiting. So he's got you know Jose's in, Van Gaal's in. You know, like like Des said, they're the only the only player the only people letting him down is the players when they don't perform when they should do. I.e. Arsenal. And you see how they perform when, when they just come to Old Trafford and walk all over us and they just didn't perform. You know, there's, there's other times when that's happened. You just need to cut them performances out. And, you know, you, know, you tried it with the big names and the, and the, the special one, and it, and it wasn't working. It was terrible football. Ollie's come in, started getting back to the kind of the United kind of football, the football that the fans want to see, attacking football. Got some of the dead wood out. Still, obviously, a little bit to go. But he's brought some good players in, and, and we've had some good results. We've had some really bad results as well. But you know, it's, it's telling if you get, if you come in a big job like this, the three-year plan, it's not not a two-year plan unless you, you're being disastrous and, and the football is terrible. You know, we win our game in hand, we're two points off first, so it's not it's not all bad. Okay, right, three more games. We'll just fire through them here because um, it wasn't a good weekend for Sheffield United and Burnley. Uh, Fulham beat. Leicester City 2-1 tonight, which was a bit of a shock. In fact, a big shock, to be fair. Uh, West Brom got a 1-0 victory over Sheffield United. And West Ham beat Aston Villa 2-1. Steve, I know you've got a lot to say about Chris Wilder and Sheffield United season so far. Now, you, stepped on, you made a very good point a few weeks ago about Bramble Lane being empty, mm. fans not being able to... Uh, to get behind the, the players. And um, we made a good point, I think, last week, Rod, about West Ham not having any fans in the stadium because it's working to their advantage not having any fans. Um, again, good result for West Ham tonight. But Steve, talk to me about um, your, your friend. <laughs> I don't think he's your friend now. <laughs> Chris Wilder. Yeah, yeah, he is. He is. I mean, I've just got to say, it as, as it is, he's, he's a guy that I, I do know and, and I certainly respect I think he's. I actually think he's absolutely brilliant in terms of the journey uh, and his character. I think his interviews at the end of the game are the best interviews in the in the Premier League. Uh, English, honest, um, and he comes from the heart, and he will not allow anybody to feel sorry for him or his team. 
So maybe that's a bit of my character coming out. I don't know, but I see his and I think, yeah, that, I'm all day with that. I know where they've been through League One, into the Championship, into the Premier League, been up against him in games in both those divisions. Myself as a coach, you have the drink after the game, the courtesy, the cocktail talk. And normally, obviously, he's been on the winning side and you've just got to go in there and suck it up. But I think he's a brilliant, a, a, a brilliant bloke, first of all. I will say this is a fact. Um, said it once on the show before, Stel, but there was a ghost goal at Aston Villa that Oli Norwood scored, which was two yards over the line, which VAR messed up. That goes in, that almost pretty much sends Sheffield United into Europe and changes their their, their world and sends Aston Villa down. So that's, the, that's the, the fickle line of football that can change on a VAR mistake. But almost from that moment that the Oli Norwood goal got disallowed, they've just slipped and gone further and further down and it looks like made some real costly mistakes along the way so it's you know I'm trying to have sympathy but um, I don't know if I've got these figures right but they're all young players you presume with potential but for now it's not happening 22 million for Brewster 18 million pound for a goalkeeper who's already got two relegations on his CV for this young player uh, that's supposed to be one for the future I think they're letting go for a million got him back for 18 so there's 40 you pay £20 million for McBurney, so there's 60 You sign Jack Rodwell. You've already signed Ravel Morrison, who's been and, been and gone. Um, you play Keon Bryan in a game on Saturday, um, who struggled at Oldham Athletic and through City Youth. Um, and then I very much watch through the week on the internet. I'm really, I watch Liverpool at training, City at training. You get access to it via the, the club websites, and it really intrigues me. And... I know we, you know, you, you're very much into the social media, and you know what attracts Stell. But for instance, I see Brewster rapping with with two lads off Soccer Aid, uh, kicking a ball around. Yet the next game at Chelsea, he had seven touches in the game. Um, I see them playing indoor cricket. Um, it's all right for team spirit, but let the cameras show them like doing something that is a little bit more. Uh, in help of them getting off the bottom of the league, you then turn up at West Brom in a pink kit. Um, again, that's got you'd not you'd like to think the manager could maybe change that, but possibly he can't. That's a marketing thing, but it's all things that, that are at the bottom of the league. You're in a pink kit. You're playing indoor cricket. You've got your your French signing who missed a chance from two yards to equalise. You know the video and him turning up in a new Rolls Royce. It's not stuff that should be happening at any level, never mind when you're bottom of the league scrapping. And then I see the integrity of Chris Wilder, who refuses to have any nonsense, anybody feeling sorry for him. And I just think he's one of the best blokes in the game as a manager, so I'd hate to see him replaced. But I think it's one point in 45, and he's the only coach this year that's not won a game in England. You know, it's hard to support it, but I do want to. Uh, but he's got to give himself a chance. At least there is a pattern to how, how they play. The creative with set plays. They tried three at the back, but overlapping centre halves. Jack O'Connell not playing at the moment has been a big miss. But there's got to be a point where you think, I keep wheeling out the same thing every week and expecting a different result, and it's not happening. I'm in with the big boys, and I'm getting punished. But the only thing I'll say on a positive, they were excellent in defeat at weekend, and hopefully they'll think that they've turned a corner. But you know how quickly. Once you're in that, it's like quicksand. You, 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 you're just getting further and further away from reality. And that's how I feel with Sheffield United. They came up and you were close to them in terms of reality. And now when I'm seeing all the nonsense around it and the league position, they're just getting further and further away from reality, in my opinion. Yeah, and to be honest, I, I said this a few weeks ago, I think the contract issue with Lundstrom hasn't helped at all because I think he was their best player the last season. Him and Fleck, obviously... Um, and Lundstrom seems to be the steel in the middle of the park. And they kind of lack that competitive edge in the middle of the park. You know, I, I, I look at Sander Berger, I see Norwood. Norwood's a fantastic footballer. You know, in terms of technical ability, he's fantastic. And Fleck is box to box. But that guy that can protect the back four, but also get forward, they're missing that. And Lundstrom is that player. And again, since he's refused to sign that new contract, he's been in and out of the team on the bench a lot of the time. And, I think that's that's been a massive problem for him. But also, as you quite rightly mentioned, the goalkeeper, Ramsdale, replacing Henderson isn't going to be easy. Or was it hasn't been easy? Well, no. And, you know, and just fought off relegation with AFC Wimbledon, been relegated with Chesterfield, been relegated with Bournemouth, but apparently 18 million is good business. Um, I don't see it. I, don't, I, I just do not see it. 
Um, and if you, you know, you do, you, you add that 60 million up, they were all calculated risks and, and it might be for the potential of the club, but not if the club goes down because mm. these lads, you know, are then going to be playing in the championship or, or you're hoping to just about get your money back with someone in the Premier League. So I don't, I don't see it. And 60 million, there's probably more. Uh, could have been far better spent, and, and I'm sure. But uh, I don't think he expected to be in this position. And like I say, my, I have so much sympathy for him because they were on the cusp of Europe. And if that Oli Norwood goal goes in at Aston Villa, which did go in and gets counted, it could change that club's fortunes forever. But almost from that moment, it's felt like they've been cursed. I just hope that they can just, you know, make more of a an honest go of it in terms of perception in, 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 in what I'm seeing. The interesting one for me is that Billy Billy Sharp seems to have been phased out a little bit now. He's not making the squad. Um, the manager, I think, and him get on, you know, superbly well. They've been through all the promotions together, but there's another player that could, you know, get you a goal or, you know, lift the team, you think, with a bit of experience. But, you know, he's not in the setup either at the moment. So I just don't see where they score and I don't see where they win still. So we all know where that ends up. Do you think people have sussed them out now because they've constantly played three five two, and while you know having wide men to get the ball in the box is the norm these days, it just seems that they're being forced to play more and more narrow, and they're not accustomed to it because most of their ball possession when they're getting forward is out wide. Yeah, but I will say, I mean, the first thing you would think of is the goals or lack of them from that point of view. Mm. But I think. I actually think Henderson in goal obviously came on for United at half time yesterday and Jack O'Connell. You've got good players, very good players, excellent players. They are they are past that. They were outstanding for Sheffield United. Henderson in goal and Jack O'Connell, who I predicted would play left centre half for England because England don't really play with a left footer there. They've just started playing Tyrone Mings, but he's had that that terrible knee injury now. So they've been a horrendous miss for that for that football club and for that manager because mm. I think they were on on the same page as the manager too, um, and it just shows you once you get a bit of momentum and a bit of spirit and you get some results and the crowd go with it, it can go one way, but it also can work the opposite, which we're actually seeing with both sides of Sheffield United now in about eight months. Great stuff, Rod Scotty Thingy got a good win tonight against Brendan Rodgers, didn't he? Uh, yeah, very good. Very good. I like Scott Park. You know, he's a good interview afterwards. He speaks well. You know, he's a good player, an honest player, a good player as well. He can play. You say that every so time I, you talk about Scotty thingy. I, I do like him, that's why. Because you know, <laughs> I said, don't, if I don't like him, I'll just say he's a prick and I don't like him, but I like him. What do you want to say? He's a good interviewer. <laughs> yeah, but Chris, no, Chris Wilder, he's done a fantastic job, but, you know, says he's racked, racked off a few names there. You know, I'm pretty sure he could have got Joe Hart for less than 18 million. You know, he's yeah. done a, a, a very, very good job. I mean, so there's about thirty, twenty million from Shrewsbury, is it? So, so you know, the manager, it's a result business. And although he's done well last year, I know Stez knows him, but you know, it's a result business. He, and he'll probably know as well as anyone because he's an honest bloke. If they don't turn around, they, they're going to have to move on because he's brought these players in. So they've got to start performing for him, you know. Brewster, you know, it's a big, big prices on, on not proven. Premier League players is a big, big risk, and you know that the managers at the forefront of that. So if it, if they don't get the results, they don't turn around. They're going to have to move on, aren't they? Yeah, but again, it's what you thinking. <laughs> but Scott, Scotty Parker did very well, even though Carragher was trying to wind him up. You know, he done he done all right. Do you know what? Leicester City they. <laughs> I, I can't imagine being a Leicester City fan because they must be so frustrated at the moment. They went to the Emirates. They beat Arsenal. They went to Ellen Road. They absolutely thumped Leeds. Um, they beat Wolves. Okay, and then they took a hiding at Liverpool and then they lose at home to Fulham. <laughs> I think, I think, I think uh, there's on to something here. You know, the modern player, I don't think the, the, the concentration and the consistency, they've got a lot of other things going on in their lives. So you, I think you're going to get these mixed results. That's how I see it. Anyway, I don't know. It's just strange how Fulham can go there and absolutely, you know, they tune them up. The game was over. All right, they, you know, they were hanging on the last five minutes because because Leicester scored a late goal. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a good result. Go on, Scotty Parker. I'm, I hope he's still to stay up. What do you reckon, Steve? Yeah. Give, give Fulham a chance. 
Uh, well, guy, yeah, I'm really pleased for them tonight because they've had, you know, I'm really pleased for the manager because when you've got a young player who scored tonight who tried the Penenka penalty in the in the last seconds, you've had someone else who slipped on a penalty, then they get another penalty tonight. It shows you they're getting in the box, at least. Uh, but it shows you they've got a bit of character because no one, I think, could have predicted that result tonight. But um, Fulham, Fulham, I saw them against Everton, you thought, oh, well, it'll be these plus two that'll go down. Um but no, they've just shown what the Premier League is tonight. Hopefully that, you know, it's competitive from top to bottom still. And it's really intriguing. It shocked me the result tonight. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I like Scott Parker. I know why Rodri likes him. Because Rodri used to wear a type in the 90s as well when he used to go out on a, on a Saturday <laughs> night. Um, like Rodney Trotter and Del Boy. So <laughs> he's seen Scott Parker bringing it back in. And he, he, <laughs> but he does speak well and he was a great player and he seemed a great guy. So... Certainly pleased for Fulham because they must have had so many miserable weekends recently in terms of thinking about the bad luck that they've had. So, you know, maybe they've turned a corner, but we'll see what happens next. Mm. OK. Final game, West Ham 2, Aston Villa 1. As, uh, as I said before, West Ham, no fans in the stadium, another win. Uh, blimey, and, and Villa missed a penalty at the end as well. Oh, sorry, they missed a penalty near the end and then they had a goal disallowed for Osad, I think it was. Um, I don't know what to say about this one, Rod, because it, when I was watching it, it just seemed like Aston Villa were probing and probing and probing and they just weren't getting anywhere. It, is, is, does David Moyes deserve more credit than what I give him, even though I give him none? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, because they, they're getting the results. And, you know, even though he, he had COVID and, and it is, it, Alan Irvine was getting the results. Even though when he come back, you know the results still continued. So, you know he is the manager. I'm pretty sure he was given the directions, even though he, when he wasn't there. So, but yeah, he's, he's doing well. You can't you can't rumble him, can you? He's probably need to when the fans come back in. That's when he probably start start that's, struggling again. That's but, exactly what's going to happen. Is it? The fans are going to be yeah, let back but, in the stadium and they're going to batter him. Yeah, it was it was a good time to score though. I was watching it and you know. Villa were probing, yeah, they got it back to one or and then second half started and I think they scored in the forty fifth minute, yeah. minute for, literally thirty seconds into the it was a poor goal to concede. So you no know, Villa missed up team chances. A guy was in the six yard box, he missed an open goal, he just a straight the keeper. Like you just said he's missed a penalty. So he's, he's they've rolled the luck a bit, but you, you need that in football. Yeah, make your own luck. Right, gentlemen, one more question before we wrap up from Julia on the Facebook page. She says, is the fact that only half the Premier League can have fans in from next weekend an unfair advantage? Say that, um, I don't think in the Premier League. It's literally like two or three thousand, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's the 12th man, isn't it? Phil Stoke. Yeah, but how, how much noise can... Mind you... Depends yeah, what kind of fan. Be, it's not going to be a... It, yeah, it's definitely an advantage for the home team. If, if it's 2,000 fans and 1,000 of them are parents and the other 1,000 are kids, you're going to hear, come on! So this, this is what I mean. You're not going to have 4,000 <laughs> piss cans just screaming constantly. Hey, you're going to have a mixed bunch. So I don't think I don't think it'll make a difference to actually think about it. Yeah. Be like Quality Street. Yeah. Steve, what do you reckon? Uh, Unfair advantage for teams that have got 2,000 fans screaming the smaller kids. clubs, the, the smaller grounds will, will probably benefit more. Better acoustics. Possibly, yeah. possibly. But, you know, who's to say that those 2,000 are going to get behind the team? Do you know what I mean? They've, they've all missed their football. And if the team go one or two nil down, they quickly turn on them. And I actually think if, if you ask footballers, um, would you want to go and play against a team in an empty stadium or you can play in front of two or 4,000 of their fans, despite there being none of your own? I actually think the lads, the pros, I think they'd say, get, yeah, get them in. I want, I want the energy. I want the energy around the ground. I, I play quicker. I play better. I concentrate more. I don't care that they'll be all for them and cheering them on. It'll, it'll, it'll bring me on too. I personally would rather play against the team with a set of supporters for the other team than an empty stadium all day. And what, It depends on what kind of support is going to get tickets as well, because they have ballots, don't they? So is it going to go to corporates? Is it going to go to long-term season ticket holders? I mean, can you imagine Tarquin at the Emirates complaining that the, the concourse isn't open to get his red wine? 
Just imagine. imagine. There, 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 there is that. There is that. But just, ju just visually, just visually, and any any noise that they make, whether it be a kid, a set of parents, or a firm uh, that have got together, that have all got tickets of, of lads that have been going for that you know going to the match for years. You know, a bit of noise in the stadium would 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 bring would bring me on and bring me to life, and would make me feel more determined to actually come on. Let's let 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 us let us let us get in amongst it here and let's turn these over. I'd I'd feel more competitive. I really would. There you go. Wonderful. Rod, do you want to add anything? Um, what do I add? Yeah. Well, you watch talk sport, don't you? We've talked about before. Stead sent me a picture before about Andy Goldstein. Have you seen it? Oh, uh, yes. He, he showed it to me you know last when, night. You know, when your kid, you know when your kid says and you're growing up and the kid's got a pair of white boots and he's got an headband, he's just getting booted, isn't he? Or he's getting two-footed. <laughs> Someone can just two-foot Andy Goldstein in the head and say, take that fucking headband off, you dick. <laughs> <laughs> How old has he got, 40? Oh, he's got an headband on. He, he, he thinks he's not talking about it either. He, th he thinks he's pillow. That's awful. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Pirlo's yeah. oh, oh. Italian, cool as fuck, and he talks properly. That's awful to hear that. <laughs> oh, oh, that's horrible to hear that. <laughs> oh. He doesn't actually say that, does he? He doesn't actually say that himself. Rodri, Rodri, we're not promoting another show, but he said to, um, to Jason Cundy last week, he said... Uh, I went in the toilets and uh, Perlo was in there, or at least I thought he was, and then I realised he just had a big mirror. <laughs> he actually said that, and then he's put a picture on his Instagram saying, can't believe that Perlo was commentating on MUTV today in a picture of himself. I mean, you say, how old is he? Is he nine? Maybe, maybe he's nine. <laughs> Perlo done shopping uh, do, you, do you think he's done that to provoke a reaction from people like us? So that well, he's done it. He's yeah, done it. He, he's winning. Like Charlie Sheen. <laughs> I obviously don't give a shit what anyone thinks. It's awful behaviour. It's rotten. Yeah. Yeah. Shame on him. Bad, bad right. Player. That's another show for another week, ladies and gents. Um, any, anything you want to add, Rod, Steve? Just thanks for having us, Stell, as always. And great to hear, Rod. And I thought he was absolutely brilliant. I say it again. The way he, he spoke about Pogba and the situation moving forward, I think it was really astute. Really enjoyed that part of the show. But thanks for having me. It's the Death Row Records uh, hoodie. That's what it is, mate. It's the Death oh, it Row is. Records hoodie. That's what it is. <laughs> West, West Side. <laughs> On that note, we'll be back very soon. <laughs> Bye. See you, lads. Yeah.